Okay. We'll be polite here and say, uh, so, <clears throat> how you been doing anyway, man? Mirden. Pretty good. Um, been working on some of the, uh, one of the problems that's been, um, on my mind for a while actually, but I haven't really had a chance to get to it was um, doing some more in-depth testing on syringe. Um, there's a few things that have to happen there. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about syringe is that not only are we, not only are we interacting with Kubernetes directly from syringe, we're also, um, uh, we're also using custom resource definitions, which is basically like an API add on, if you can think of it that way. Um, where basically you define a new type of object that you want to, to be able to create instances of in the Kubernetes API, and then you have to create instances of that. So it's like an it's like extens it's like an extensibility kind of thing, um, and and that's how Multis, by the way, that's how Multis uses. It's what Multis requires actually, um, in order to get its network configuration. Hmm. And and so the the thing on the syringe side is we don't want to deal with any YAML files, and so we're actually just using pure go to define things like you know all of the various structs and um and functions that are needed to interact with kubernetes directly the problem with that is um in order to also do the crd generation we have to auto generate the go to to make that happen um and there's a lot of complexity there it's, it's certainly possible there's there's tooling that they've provided the kubernetes community has provided to make that all possible but it's just it's very complicated um, and that's just to get it working in general, uh, add on to the, add on to that, the idea of testing, um, our, the scheduler portion of, of syringe, which is what actually interacts with Kubernetes. Um, and you, 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 you have a, a kind of a mess. <laughs> um, and so it took me a while to wrap my head around how to refactor the, the scheduler to a, be much more testable, which I had to, I had to get back into the roots of, of writing testable code in go in general. I unfortunately have the um, what the history. Mean, when you say the schedule, do you, are you, do you mean syringe? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. So, so syringe is actually two subcomponents. It's all one binary, but in, if you look at the code, it's separated out into two two sort of subcomponents. There's the scheduler, which is really just a bunch of logic about you know what to create with inside of Kubernetes and when. Um, and then there's the API layer. So you interact with the API layer. From the from the front end, you know, usually ended at web, um, and then what happens is the API makes decisions on on what kind of internal messages to send to the scheduler as appropriate. Like for instance, hey, this this lesson already exists. I just need you to create, um, or I need you to modify it, um, or maybe it doesn't exist. I need you to create it from scratch. There are there are a few message types that you can send to the scheduler um, from within Syringe, uh, but. Anyway, the uh, yeah, so the, so the scheduler portion of, of syringe is what's is what is responsible for interacting directly with Kubernetes, and so that's where all the CRD stuff happens. And again, it can't happen with YAML, which is what you would normally do if you're like an operator and you wanted to use Kubernetes and define your own CRD. It's actually pretty easy. Um, there's a there's a you just do a kubectl create. There's a type of manifest that you can create, um, which I was doing by the way a long time ago. Um, when we were testing out Multis, um, that's how I tested it, was to just define the YAML files that I knew Multis required because it was in the documentation that way. Then I had the, the, the difficult task of converting all of that into effectively native Go. Um, and it, it all has to be auto, uh, you know, automatically generated. So if we want to add a field, we don't have to go you know, screw around with the generated code. We can just change the, the model that's created and, and it automatically generates from there. So anyway, the reason I bring all that up is um, I effectively ignored the whole, like just didn't write any tests for that. Um, a whore, obviously a, a big shortcoming thus far. Um, I'm glad I'm finally addressing it now, but for a while it was just something that was, it kept biting me. Um, you know, every once in a while there would be an issue that, that was, that would have been caught if I had proper tests. So the more, the more other to do's I was able to knock off, the more I was able to focus on this. And so I'm finally writing tests for the scheduler um, just because I had some time to dedicate to it. Nice. So that's what I've been doing lately. Sorry, that's a very long form response to your question. But no, it's fine. It's totally fine. That's, that's a very, that's a very long winded way of saying I've been busy. <laughs> yeah. I went to the Campbell's farmer market this weekend. You did. Yeah. What, what even is that? 
uh, they sell vegetables and stuff there and like arts and crafts and Like Campbell's, like Campbell's soup. No, Sorry if that's no, there's super a, ignorant. There's a, <laughs> there's I was a, thinking, like, what if, what if, like, Campbell's the corporation was able to like sponsor a farmer's market? right, right. It would be, I don't know. It's not super far booth fetched. after booth of like cans of soup. Yeah. Um, no, this Campbell's a place. It's just next to San Jose here. And, Oh, I knew that. I used to work for eBay. eBay yeah, is based there. Yeah. I'd never been to a, a farmer's market in, uh, California. So I, I decided to go with uh, a couple of Nice. friends of mine. Yep. And we Nice. get, got detoured into a brewery, of course. And, You got detoured? uh, yeah, I I just, love how you worded that. uh, I was You forced. worded that in Yeah. a way that was like, someone made this happen on my behalf. It was, I don't, you it know, was not against in control. my will. I did not go to that brewery <laughs> on my I don't own. go to many breweries, man. Like, I don't really know what that's all about. <laughs> <laughs> it was good though. Um, the Campbell Brewing Company, and we ended up eating. I had Russian poutine, which which was there's nothing Russian about it whatsoever. It was I was going to say, how does that even work? it was just French fries, um, ribs, and um, like two different kinds of cheese in a big sadness bowl. S served with your whatever beer you want off their menu. It was good. It was tasty. It was ten bucks actually. It was a great deal. But that's what I did on Sunday. So, so, uh, Speaking of speaking of who, I hear Dane Cook's trying to make a comeback. I don't know how that's going to work. Dane Cook. Yeah, who's Dane you said Cook? Sadness Bowl. That's that's where that's from. Oh, is it? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Oh, yeah, I guess it is, isn't it? Yeah, he was talking about the um the KFC um I don't know what they were <laughs> like. A, he he called it like a um a fail pile in a sadness bowl or something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm chuckling just thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> so um, for those of you joining us, I'm Derek Winkworth. I'm Cloud Toad on Twitter. And this is uh, Matt Oswald. He's Mirrodin on Twitter. Uh, I am a... I am the community manager for Entry Labs. This is Entry Labs TV. You don't see the logo yet because I haven't done that yet, but I will put a logo on here so you know that it's Entry Labs TV. I don't normally stream from a prison cell, which is what I'm in right now with very poor lighting, but I am in California, not in my home office, which is which is more suited for um, you know doing these kind of things. So I apologize for the lighting. There's nothing I can really do. The uh, the the meeting rooms there are not optimized for streams. Uh, they're optimized for interrogation. Yeah, they're not good for human seeing either. Like and and like review discussions and like disciplinary action. <laughs> right. <laughs> It's the yeah, there's like a, they're built to have a psychological effect on you. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, let's go into one on one room. It'll it'll all go it'll all go well. <laughs> Oh my goodness! Yeah, it's it's. I hate these lights. They're super. They're like incredibly bright, but they yeah. they don't fill the room up with light somehow. Yeah. Um. So we're so today we're uh, last week we had a pretty good session. It was recorded. If you missed it, we talked about um, some pretty significant and uh, positive changes to um, self medicate, which is the platform you use to develop lessons for NRE Labs. Um, if you haven't seen that, uh, stream yet, it's out on YouTube. It's recorded. Um, you know, go check it out. Um, if you haven't played with self-medicate yet, uh, you know, and you, and you have a machine with eight gigs of Ram, uh, you should definitely check it out. Uh, it's, it's a, it's, it's the best way to write lessons for NRE labs. Um, and also to, you can consume lessons with NRE labs if you want to consume them offline. For some reason, you can use uh, uh, self-medicate to do that. This week, I think what we're going to uh, cover is, is uh, some open issues uh, we have um, in our GitHub repository, and plus some just general discussion uh, around where we're going to go with NRE Labs. Um, if you are watching and you have questions, just feel free to uh, to type in the chat there um, on Twitch. And... Um, We'll try to answer, you know, we will answer, even if we just make it up, it'll be funny, whatever. We, we will try, we will try to get to your question. We usually get thousands of questions during this, during these streams. Yeah. So, uh, probably won't be able to get to all of you just because there's so many, um, excited fans. How many, <laughs> I don't want to know how many people, but it'll, it'll build. Just give it time. <laughs> Everything's all about time. Yes. Okay. Um, 
so I can't so I... actually uh, do anything on this on this uh, since I'm hosting this this video conference. I can't do anything because if I switch windows, it'll freeze. Oh right. So um, if you can uh, share the issues page for Henry Labs, then and then we can talk about it. I I lost where I oh here it is. I gotcha. Um, entire screen. You there know, we, we should probably have a third person log in and do that, or use a third account. To do what? To share a screen. That way, um, no, it wouldn't work. I don't think it would work. Um, can you see anything right now? Looks like Discord froze on me. I can see everything, yeah. I can see your screen. I can see your mouse moving. Really? Yeah. Oh, I see, oh. I see code. Okay, cool. Um, I will just ignore the frozen nature of Discord then. So this is um, the next. So the current release that's deployed on Unary Labs is 0.3.0. Um, so every time we do a release, we spin up a second, um, a second project here in GitHub to sort of throw some future, uh, future issues and pull requests into. Did we lose Did Matt? We Matt? I, I think so. No, you're there. I hear hey. you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it just relaunched. Can you still see my screen? Yeah. No, no, but you're there. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I think Discord did crash. Okay, much better. Can you see my screen again? I do. I see it. All right. Yeah, I it it crashed and, and must have reloaded, so... Um, okay. Anyway, uh, as I was saying, uh, what we normally do is when when we're working on a release, we have like a we have we usually have two projects up, especially the closer we get to a release. So like um, as we're working down this uh, um, this project plan, uh, if we feel like punting a certain issue to the next release, we'll we'll have a second we'll have a second project spun up. In this case, it'll be zero dot three dot two. Um, that way, we just sort of it's a way of us punting an, an issue. But the but the but the current release is 0.3.0. And so that means the the release planning we're going through right now is is dot one. Now um, we one one thing I should say is the current plan. Um, this is that we it, we we did o dot three dot o for NFD, and there's been a a bunch of different events since then. So the current project plan is not exactly finalized. Um, mostly the mostly the issues that are here are just there because a. Uh, a because I uh, I felt like they they should be in 0.3.1 or if um or a lot of them I've punted from 0.3.0 so um we still I think this week would be a good time to go through and actually prune these and make sure that the issues and pull requests that are here um you know are actually supposed to be here um so just to keep that in mind not not all of this is uh is accurate so some of these issues will probably get punted. And um, also, there will be. There's actually quite a few issues that I've created recently that I do want in 0.3.1, so they're not even in here yet. Okay. Um, but the URL should be the same slash five, so you can go back here and 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 see the the state of things. All right. So, what do you want to talk about first? Well, the one thing is, um, I, I I I want to talk about um, uh, this particular thing. I, I I have had this on my mind. I, I opened this just a little bit ago because I wanted to make sure I remembered it. Um, but going on the the theme of I guess last week, um, where we talked about self medicate being the development environment, um, you still if even even though you have like a, a you know a, a little Kubernetes cluster you can spin up locally and it's fully automated through the self medicate script that's all cool but um, it's still not it's super intuitive how to build a lesson the the best thing that you can do at the moment is look at the existing lessons in the directory and then pick one that you think is pretty close to what you want to do and then sort of reverse engineer it and start editing stuff. What would be cooler is if there was some sort of a wizard that allowed you to basically say, hey, I'd like to start a new lesson. And then it walks you through step by step, every, you know, a bunch of interactive questions that say, like, you know, what kind of what kind of lesson is this? Is this a fundamentals lesson? Is this a, you know, tools lesson? Is it a workflows lesson? That kind of thing. Um, what would you like to call it? How many how many labs will there be, will, will there be in this lesson? Um, will there be any network devices? That kind of thing. Uh, so I want to do that. I think that's that's a I, I think that's another one of those big needle moving exercises, uh, just like self medicate for ensuring that people have uh, as as little barrier to entry as possible to you know contribute curriculum. Uh, we we when we when we built NRE Labs, we obviously wanted to focus on making it easy for for the learner. 
Um, yep. And I think now that now that NRE Labs has been out for a while, it's important that we start turning our attention to make things a lot easier for the for the teacher. Because uh, there's a lot of really great content out there, and we just want to make sure the barrier to to entry for contributing content is as low as possible. Just like, just like the spirit of Venery Labs in general, making sure that there are no barriers for the learner. So, when you usually interactive wizards are very, you know, sort of a lot of UI thinking goes into making them. Are you going to do some mocks, like mockups, before you um go yeah. down this path, or? Yeah, that's fair. I mean, one of the one of the things. Um, I I mean, I w mentally in my head, I'm taking inspiration from um, there was a lot of, of work kind of like this done um, back in my days when I worked at Stackstorm because um, there uh, pretty much anything you define in Stackstorm is done via a YAML file which again if you don't know anything about Stackstorm it's not intuitive you kind of have to find an example out there that already defines something that's kind of close to what you want and then you sort of have to reverse engineer it um, but there are a few commands in Stackstorm where you can just say like hey I want to create a new X and um, what this what the Stackstorm utility will do is it'll go through the, all of the various fields that it knows that it will need, and it'll ask you intuitive questions about each one. Where it'll say something like, "Okay, um, here's the here's the description field, but beyond just like saying please enter the value for this field, uh, it'll do something like, um, you know, hey, here's here the, here's what makes a good description, that kind of thing." So the so I think the first step would be to yes, I think the first step would be to look at all of the all of the various fields in the uh, in the in the the protobuf de definition for a lesson definition in syringe, and then from those fields uh, create an interactive um, wizard that makes sure that all of those uh, fields have an opportunity to get populated. Now, how that's presented to the user, you know, what kind of like plain English things like that stuff? Yes, I think we should mock that out. But generally speaking, the type of data that we need is is already a known thing. We just need to put some English around it to make it intuitive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That sounds good. That's a great idea. Anything that can, you know, make it, any part of using this easier um, is <laughs> is important, right? Especially, you know, especially while we're trying to build a community up. Oh, you have many tabs open. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. In fact, uh, I changed the the width so that I could have more open. Firefox, what it'll do is it'll start scrolling, which is not what I'm accustomed to. I used to run Chrome. And uh, um, Chrome would basically just keep opening tabs until all of the icons disappear, which is normally what I would get to. So I'm being extremely conservative right, right now. But um, yeah, there are a few other things. Like one thing, one thing that I, I, I were, was working on a, a, a little bit last week and then definitely the week before was all of the self-medicate docs. So I still have this issue open where I say the docs are outdated. I think the structure for the for the docs um, are good. I think that's fine right now. Um, it's just that a lot of the content, if you look at it, is is pretty old. Um, in particular, if you look at like um, architecture, like this diagram is correct, but it it's not as verbose as I would like it to be. We have better architecture diagrams at this point. Um, Lesson networking is also um, behind, like the explanation of how networking works um, is, uh, is, is again, functional, but it's not really relevant to what we're doing. Like we're running BusyVox here. Basically, I just put a bunch of YAML files up here. So it's, it's verbose, but it's not, it's not exactly clear. I right. could put some more love into that. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so there's there's some things that I, I want to do from from a documentation perspective to improve that. Um, uh, certainly more syringe docs like the syringe.yaml file. These are also extremely old, like SSH user and SSH password. Um, those are those fields are not there anymore. They don't exist, so that's that's old. Um, subnet this field will go away because that field's actually ignored um, at the moment, so that's not relevant. So there's a bunch of stuff in here that's that's sort of extra. Same with configs. All of that stuff is deterministic based on the directory guide or the directory name. Um, so yeah, it, there's just the I think the docs need some love at this point. They're 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 showing their age. A lot a lot of these docs were originally created well before the release, and they haven't really been touched since. <clears throat> hmm. Seems important. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, and that includes documentation for self-medicate, right? 
Yeah, that 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 particular portion of the docs is much more up to date just because I I edited that um, alongside the changes to self medicate. So this page is, um, you know, pretty up to date. Not saying it's perfectly like you know, totally accurate. There might be some typos or whatnot, but um, this is definitely up to date because I, I updated this as I was develop as I was making the changes to the actual self medicate script. So this this is definitely up to date. Nice. But everything else, like I said, everything else is some of it. Some of it's it's all it's like you know seventy to eighty percent still fine. It's just showing its age a little bit. So you could probably suss out the details. Generally speaking, it's just some of the the smaller changes that we that we need to be able to put in place need to be there. So. Um, one thing that's not on the guide because it's more of an R and D kind of thing or on, in the lesson, in the, in the, in the plan, um, we, the, the, I was looking at this architecture diagram, um, and it reminded me one of the things that we did when we first developed NRA labs was we made sure that Kubernetes was the common denominator, meaning while we, while we are deploying Kubernetes as a, we call it a DIY cluster. Um, for those that aren't familiar with Kubernetes, you can, it's an open source project, so you can certainly deploy your own version of Kubernetes on your own infrastructure. And that's what we've done using just regular VMs on Google Compute Engine. But there are also plenty of other hosted offerings out there, um, including by Google, they call it GKE. Um, and so basically what that means is you don't manage the VMs, um, you just manage uh, what you put into Kubernetes. So you're provided with the, the, the you know, the API server um, the, or the AP, you're provided with the Kubernetes API and they, they just manage all of it for you. Right. AWS um, you is have, their EKS, right? EKS. Uh -huh. Yep. Yep. And it's a pretty common model. I mean, I think, I think you, you get access to the VMs that they spin up. Um, you have some flexibility there, but you don't have any access to the API server or any of the, the infrastructure for running it. Which is fine. I don't. I don't think we really need that. the 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 reason we didn't go in that direction um, is is pretty simple, actually. Uh, is because Multis is a CNI plugin, and uh, to my knowledge, no existing um, hosted Kubernetes offering allows you to use your own CNI plugin. It's viewed as a it's viewed as a fairly infrastructure, you know, critical infrastructure kind of thing. Um, you you will use the networking that they tell you to use. Um, and again, normally this is okay because most of the time the requirements from a networking perspective aren't actually that big of a deal. Uh, you certainly, most people that use those hosted offerings certainly don't need multiple network interfaces per pod like we do. Mostly they're hosting just you know applications, and uh, they just need a an a network interface and they need them to talk to each other, which anything in the hosted offerings is going to provide. Yeah, you can interact with so um, at the CNI layer with EKS, but you have to use Calico. Yeah, I did see that. Yeah, they they have a partnership there. Um, but yeah, Calico, it, um, it supports just that one CNI plugin instead of allowing you to put in your own. Right. Um, I think if you if you I mean you you probably could like I, I was looking at GKE originally, and I think you know you have access to the to the to the to the compute nodes. You could put your own configurations into place, but I you know at that point you're pretty much hosed if you have to open a support case. So anyway, um, the the I, I've I've come to be aware of a project, um, which is actually pretty interesting. I haven't done anything with it technically yet, but the more I look at these slides, the more I'm I'm encouraged to move forward with a basic uh, you know basic proof of concept, um, and it's called network service mesh. Now, if you're familiar with network, if you're familiar with service messages in general, or if you're not, I, I guess if you're not familiar with them, effectively what a service mesh allows you to do is um, deploy uh, it, it effectively allows you to manage the application um, the the application flows around your you know your topology or your around your uh, you know your cluster and allow your your application endpoints to talk to each other um, without requiring more low level networking uh, like like at the CNI layer or certainly at the physical layer so it's like overlays upon overlays okay now normally the the reason this is useful is um, it, it allows you to get uh, telemetry and, and um, fine-grained control a lot closer to the application. So normally what, what we would have is some sort of a centralized load balancer like Nginx running in Kubernetes, or um, even further out, you might have a virtual or a hardware load balancer that's sitting outside the cluster entirely, and then there's some sort of API integration that, that directs application calls appropriately. Um, 
what uh, the way service meshes normally work is there's usually a sidecar the deployed alongside the uh, alongside the the application itself. And what this does is it normalizes a, a lot of that uh, a lot of that traffic to a single sort of a single uh, you know known um, uh, secure topology kind of thing, right? And so instead of making sure that you know all of your applications speak HTTPS and they all use the correct version of TLS and all of, all of these things, you just deploy a sidecar proxy alongside all of your applications, and then you focus on the configuration of that proxy. Um, and that way, you know, everything looks like it's coming from the same sort of kind of application server, even though the underlying application is totally different. Hmm. So that's kind of cool. There, I, not the use cases there are, are are limited. I think to to some people with some pretty complicated setups. Um, if you're really just looking to deploy a simple app, you you might not get a ton of information uh, value there. There's some other use case. There's some other uh, there's some other reasons why you might want to do that specifically around visibility. So you have. Um, visibility into what kind of network traffic is being sent without having to talk to the networking team, which you and I have a very different perspective on. Um, <laughs> I think, I think, if anything, the network, the networking folks, uh, you know, the traditional network engineers might actually be fairly well served learning about service meshes so that they can still be able to do some translation between what they already know, which is the physical network and, and the virtual network, with the constructs of a service mesh. Um, I'm not in favor of using a service mesh to sort of bypass the networking team, although it is a cool tool in and of itself if if it's uh, if it's you know used appropriately by the appropriate people. Hmm. Um, anyway, that's what a service mesh is in general. Uh, there's a particular project called Network Service Mesh, which applies the same kind of principles, but it takes um, it moves down the OSI layer instead of just permitting layer you know certain uh, application layer types of traffic like HTTP. Um, it actually provides L2 and L3 connectivity um, between uh, between entities um, uh, that you that you deploy. Very similar to how what we do in Multis, where we declare effectively um, virtual networks to plug people into or to plug pods into. Um, you can create layer two, layer three VPNs between pods dynamically, and uh, it'll take care of connecting them uh, on your behalf. So it's effectively a service mesh, but it 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 allow it it, it you, the the way that it connects between pods is not um, you know basic proxy HTTP routing. It's actually done via uh, an L two VPN, which is kind of cool. Nice. This is pretty cool. This URL uh, you should share that with uh, the audience in some fashion, I guess, in our chat. <laughs> And uh, uh, sure, yeah, I closed the stream because it was uh, making me feel like I had schizophrenia, but I can reopen it. Oh, this is gonna be this is gonna be weird. I can I can mute. There we go. So that's that's the the link that I've had open. Uh, stupid <laughs> ad. Ads within ads, yay! Uh, so that's there. Um, the reason, by the way, the reason I'm bringing this up is because the way that it actually does the connectivity is not by connecting. So say, let's bring this into NRE Labs. Um, we have pods that are running like a VQFX device. Um, again, the way that we have networking work uh, right now is Syringe specifies the various Multis configurations that it needs to, and then attaches each pod to the relevant network. <clears throat> and by the way, those networks are all just Linux bridge based. So it all just basically gets locally bridged, um, which makes that pretty easy actually. So we just make sure that all the pods are on the same host within a lesson. And then, and then they just get connected via bridge, and, and it's, it's actually fairly straightforward. So this is definitely more complicated than that. But the benefit to, to doing it this way is um, the connectivity is not actually done directly to the pod. Um, it's done via a sidecar. Um, so so just, like, just like we would put a sidecar proxy like Envoy um, onto one of our applications if we're doing like a, a, you know, Istio, some, some other type of service mesh. Similarly, we would have a sidecar proxy for each of our um, for each of our network devices, but again, it would permit all kinds of traffic, uh, including layer two. Um, and so, what we could do is we could build diverse topologies, just like we're doing with Multis, but we would be using this particular platform uh, as opposed to using a CNI plugin, because again, all of this is taking place above the CNI layer. It's it's effectively an overlay at that point. Um, so we could use any CNI plugin that was offered to us, because again, we just needed to be able to talk between hosts in order to make this overlay work. Now. Um, the, um, the, the cool thing I think about this particular architecture is that because we're not using CNI, 
we can then start to think about moving to some other hosted offering instead of building our own Kubernetes cluster. Now, uh, there, there's two things that I want to call out there. A, um, if we do and end up going down this path, and, and like I said, I haven't done any testing yet, so there, there's still a lot of R&D work that needs to be done to make sure this is viable. But let's assume that it's viable. Um, we'll probably think about moving to this for the, for the, you know, the, the NRE Labs, the hosted content that we have. Um, but the existing approach won't get ripped out. Um, effectively, what we would do um, on the syringe side, which is what's really controlling all of this, is provide a configuration option, excuse me, a configuration option that says, hey, um, you know, I'm deploying on top of GKE, so I need you to use the network service mesh effectively like a plugin. We would develop something like that, where we say, like, I want to use network service mesh for, for my networking. Um, uh, the trade-off being it's a little more complicated, and you have to deploy, um, there's actually like a, a kind of a controller that you have to deploy um, within uh, within Kubernetes, as opposed to Multis, which, is, which uh, really doesn't need a controller, it just needs the Multis binary on each host. Um, so network service mesh is definitely more complicated, but it allows you to run in environments that don't let you screw around with that lower level functionality. But again, um, if we're running in something like self-medicate, like no, no joke, network service mesh is total overkill. So um, we want to continue to provide this, the existing functionality that's, that's been built and iterated on over, you know, the past few months. So we would, we would effectively be providing both. You would just have to choose in the syringe configuration which one you wanted. So we'd probably default to Multis just because we've done that for a long time, but then provide an ability to say, hey, I want to use network service mesh. Hmm. All right. So, um, yeah, this is very cool. And if you're, and if, uh, you're out there and you're seeing this, you should definitely, um, you should definitely go to this website, networkservicemesh.io uh, slash docs slash concepts and uh mm -hmm. they have videos and um instructions and, and so on um and you can see what that's all about that's that's pretty cool um yeah and thanks to dimitri uh Kalinsev. he's a member of our enterprise marketing team he sent me a, he sent me this link he made me aware of this so thanks to him for the heads up nice yeah dimitri is a pretty knowledgeable guy uh i uh I, I, I do want to mention the point of this. The reason the reason people should care about whether or not we use this in in our production instance is um, getting away from a model of having to run our own Kubernetes cluster is is a good thing. Um, we we have we our current Kubernetes cluster is intentionally under undersized. Like we don't have a you know multiple nodes for the etcd database that sits behind the scenes. So we've We've just basically been holding on on adding to that uh, because we wanted to go in this direction. We'd prefer to go in this direction as opposed to putting a lot more engineering time into effectively um, managing our own cluster, which is just time that we won't be able to spend on, you know, improving the platform. And so, uh, w you know, we as a result, we've we've had some outages, like the etcd cluster. You know, when when uh, for instance, when GCE does maintenance on our hosts on our VMs. Um, the etcd the single node etcd cluster tends to not like that um and so we've had issues uh just by just by virtue of us running our own cluster on top of vms and so the the net i think to the community as well as you know users of 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 the site that we're that we're sponsoring i think the benefit is pretty clear like not uh not only will we probably i would i would i would assume and i would hope that we would be able to enjoy better uptime just because we would be running on top of a kubernetes cluster <laughs> managed by people that know what they're doing um as well as uh you know the fact that we don't have to spend all of that time in in managing all of that means uh just that much more effort can be committed to improving the platform and making improvements to things like self-medicate and things like the the documentation and all that kind of stuff. The more the more we can focus on just that portion, I think the better everybody will, you know, better everybody will be. All right. All right. So, um, what's the next thing? What do you got on the list? Um, there's a few things. Um, there's some bugs that need to get fixed. Uh, by the way, the uh, um, one thing that people might not know, just because the, the utility has only existed for uh, a little bit outside of some really niche use cases. Um, when, uh, the Syringe uh, project, when you compile Syringe, you actually get two binaries. You get Syringe D, which is the actual Syringe component that orchestrates NRE Labs, um, you know, or, or really the, the, you know, the whole project. 
um, you know, runs things against, uh, creates resources within Kubernetes and whatnot. <clears throat> but there's actually a second binary. There's there's also uh, SYRCTL. Now that's existed for a while, but again, I haven't really, you know, publicized that a lot just because most of the things that that, um, that, that, uh, that, that binary did were really some basic debug stuff for, for me. So I could, uh, you know, look into the state of uh, syringe uh, and inspect it. It's effect it was effectively calling gRPC functions. Um, so I could see things like what live lessons are, are running, um, what lesson definitions exist within syringe, uh, the, you know, again, the, the running instance is effectively like an API client. It's a CLI, CLI uh, um, component that you can use to, to query syringe. Um, but again, most of the things that's, that the that SYRCTL did um, was not super useful to most people, just just sort of me. But um, that's sort of changing. I've uh, in the past few months, I added a command called SYRCTL validate, which is pretty cool. Um, if you and I can actually run this now, um, uh, as long as I have it compiled, I'm pretty sure I do. Yeah. So um, as as you can see, there's a few things like uh, the whitelist functionality, as well as uh, inspecting live lessons in Kublab. Those are internal syringe things that really nobody really probably cares about. Um, you could you could see most things that you need from, from that perspective via the log. So that's not as useful. But one command that's very useful is, is validate. Um, this is definitely something that users should be able to um, use, or not users, but uh, you know contributors, uh, lesson contributors, should definitely become more familiar with. Um, and I'm going to go out to, sorry, we're doing some uh, image work uh, here. Uh, if we do uh, SYRCTL validate, um, uh, and then we place, I believe, just a, a positional argument here, uh, antidote. Actually, just do that. Um, what you can see here is that it's actually importing all of the uh, all of the lessons that are in the directory that we specified. So if you look, I'm in the antidote directory right now. So this is the same repo that's out there on GitHub. Um, and you can see we have a lessons directory in here. So what what'll what'll happen is when you pass the direct the local directory, which is dot the current directory that I'm in, um, it'll run through the exact same validation logic that it normally runs through when um, when you start syringe for the first time. Um, so let, let me actually just do like a kubectl uh, delete pod, and I'll delete the PTR instance of syringe, um, so we can see a fresh start. Let me close this too. Logs, PTR, syringe. So you can see it's kind of doing the same thing um, that we saw before. So it says uh, successfully imported lesson 12, 13, 14, 15, so on and so forth. Um, it's doing the exact same thing at startup. But the benefit of using SYRCTL is that you don't actually have to be running syringe. There's a bunch of stuff that syringe D, the other, you know, the actual server binary. Um, there's a lot of stuff that that needs to, to run, um, including being able to connect to Kubernetes. The benefit of being able to run this validate command in SYRCTL is you're using the exact same logic. It actually uses the exact same code within the syringe um, project, um, but it doesn't require you to, to actually be running syringe the, the server. It's just that it's just that that functionality is exposed via this command line utility. Now, the reason this is super cool is you can develop your own lessons and then use this command to make sure that the lesson is being imported into syringe successfully so that when you're developing lessons, you have confidence that it's actually going to work. Um, so that actually exists. Uh, there are two things that I think, two, two more things that are needed to make this really super valuable. Um, first off, uh, I, what we haven't been doing with, um, when we release new versions of, of NRE labs or the, or the antidote project rather, um, one thing that we are not doing currently is, um, public, uh, releasing, um, you know, compiling, uh, all platforms, uh, compiling binaries for syringe across all platforms and putting them into the GitHub releases. Um, the reason we haven't been doing that is because normally we don't really use syringe as the binary. We just build the Docker image and that's fine because that's, that's normally how syringe is deployed. It's deployed into the Kubernetes cluster that we're running. And then, um, and then of course that, that, that image has the binaries inside of it. Um, and so we don't really need to, to, to compile all of the platforms. We just need to compile for Linux and, it, and then um, it's deployed within that image. However, if you want to be able to run this on your laptop, you know, you might be running Windows, you might be running, um, you know, a Mac OS, Darwin, that kind of thing, um, FreeBSD, probably, uh, do, you know, some, some other thing there. So we, we need to be able to, to offer downloads for all of those things if, if this is going to be something that somebody can go, you know, download on their own. 
So we need to do that. Uh, we need to improve the release process so that that, that gets done as well. Um, and then once that's done, uh, we actually, uh, I'm going to, I'm going to be adding this command, this actual command, SYRCTL validate to the CI process for the antidote repo. So that whenever somebody opens a pull request, um, the Travis CI, uh, connect, you know, the, the Travis CI job that'll get kicked off will perform a validation on the, uh, you know, the lessons directory in that repo. And it'll tell us if there's, you know, an issue with that. It, it helps not just from, you know, people contributing lessons, but it also helps reviewers. They can see that the SYRCTL validate command succeeded. So they don't need to go through and do all of the, you know, pedantic, like, oh, you need to make sure this file's here and this file's named differently. Like, you don't have to do any of that. You can just focus on 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 the, the, true, the true value that reviews provide, which I'm always in favor of. Hmm. So this is a cool tool. I'd like, I'd like people to become more familiar with it. But like I said, there's some homework that we have to do on our side to make sure that it gets into people's hands um, easily. But once that's done, I think, I think this will prove pretty valuable. And by the way, um, what we were talking about earlier with being able to provide a wizard that allowed people to more dynamically create uh, lessons um, without having to really know how to build a lesson manually, they just go through the wizard. I would imagine that that becomes another sub command within SYRCTL. Um, because the the the, the pro, you know the the binary is already there; it already exists. Um, we would just add a sub command to it. So, like, if I'm I'm developing a lesson on inside of uh, inside of self medicate, right? And um, I'm yep. I'm making changes to a local directory using the local directory feature that that is new to uh, as of as of last release for uh, self medicate. Yeah. Um. And I think I'm ready to to restart um, syringe rather than restart it and uh, you know sort of blindly I can run this command and validate that at the very least this, the syntax and everything is correct for how my lesson is laid out in, in its directory and then I can restart uh, syringe yeah totally totally in fact um, I would say um, the cool one of the cool things about the change to self-medicate having you know using local directories instead of requiring you to commit and push your changes um, it's almost exactly the same amount of time just restarting syringe inside of self-medicate. You probably get feedback pretty quickly. Um, but, but to your point, like, especially early on, like you, you're going to, you're going to know, um, you know, effectively, um, uh, when you have a lesson already created, you kind of know that all the pieces are there. I think this validate command is even more useful, um, way earlier in the process. Like it, like as you're as you're building out the basic layout of a lesson, um, it's so much more valuable to know if you've missed you know a certain component. Like for instance, if you um, if you like for instance if you have a, you know a, a stage one already done for your lesson and you're looking at doing a stage two, um, if you restart syringe, it's going to restart the whole lesson. And so in order to get to stage two, um, it, it will actually that actually will take a decent amount of time. Um, so uh, in that case, yeah, absolutely. If you're if you're just developing, if you're if you're just adding the files in general, and you you want to know that something's there, um, just like you said, SYRCTL validate is is way faster than waiting for um, the lesson to get spun up. Now um, there will be a few things that won't get detected here. Like for instance, if you have the um, you know a bunch of network configurations in your lesson. Um, the validate command doesn't go through and like do a Junos commit or anything like that. It's not running Junos at all. It's, it doesn't know how to deal with that. So um, it won't, it won't check to make sure like your configurations are valid or, or that they do what they need to do. Sure. It, um, it, it, this is, this is all about what syringe uh, knows about, which is the basic layout of a lesson, the different, certainly the syringe file. So syringe.yaml, all of the fields that are there, there are, some, there are some fields that are required. Um, and then there are some other fields that are not required, but maybe if they are provided, they need to be a certain type, like that kind of thing. That kind of stuff, it, it will get captured here. Um, but just FYI, this isn't a panacea. You won't be able to run this and be like, okay, my lesson's perfect. Um, you know, it's not going to catch typos in your lesson, guys. You know, nothing like that. Although we could add some tooling to help with that too. But not not via syringe. Syringe is much more uh, about the the way that the lesson actually runs on the back end. So naturally, this validate command is focused on that. Nice. Wow, that's really cool, dude. So, and when is that? Uh, do you expect that to be merged? Well, it's already merged. The functionality is there. The 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 um, and certainly, if you wanted to um, just run, if you have Docker installed, you can do this. Um, the like I said, the only the only piece that's missing is for us to pre-compile b uh, binaries for all architectures, so that you could just curl the binary of your choice. 
um, and put it into your put it into your system and, and install it. You can build the command. Um, if you do Docker, uh, let's see. If you do uh, uh, volume, uh, how did I do this before? Uh, probably not volume. Uh, Antidote Labs syringe, and then we'll just uh, name it. And we'll do RM. And then, yeah, so volume, um, we'll do uh, PWD, which is the current directory we're in. So basically the antidote repo here on my file system. And we'll mount that to slash antidote within the container. And I think that's all I need. I would just need to add CTL validate. So the binary SYRCTL is in the Docker image. So if you have Docker installed, you can do it this way. Um, and by mount and by mapping this volume, um, you're you know I'm I'm in the antidote repo now, and I'm mounting that local directory into the container file system at at root you know dir uh, root directory slash antidote, and then uh, I'm running the antidote lab uh, slash syringe image, and then I'm running the binary SYRCTL validate, and then slash antidote. That should work. Yeah. So that's that's what I've done there. Um, so you could do this today. Uh, but like I said, it's not um, it's not a simple matter of just running SRCTL. You have to add all this stuff with Docker. So you can definitely do that today. Um, you know, there's nothing prohibiting you from doing that. But um, one thing I want to be able to do is just allow people to run the binaries so they don't have to run Docker on their machine. Sure. Um, especially if you're not running Linux, like running Docker can be kind of uh, um, kind of a bit much because uh, normally you have to run a VM. Uh, now the Docker client for Mac uh, works really well. It doesn't really require you to know much about that, but it, it's just a little much um, for just running a really lightweight binary. So I'd rather allow people to just download that directly. So you can do this today, um, but but the but the in the next few uh, the next week or so, um, I'll be putting some effort into the the deployment pipeline for Syringe to make sure the binaries, in addition to the Docker image, which is being published today. Uh, I'd like to also make sure that the, the binaries themselves are pre-compiled and available for download if you wish to go that direction. All right. So let's, let's move on here. Uh, can you come back on camera? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Can you see me? Not yet? Maybe? Uh, nope, not yet. There we go. <laughs> We're pros at this. <laughs> oh, it's a spinning circle now. So um, while that's spinning, uh, I just wanted to cover some things that aren't necessarily technical. Uh, we, yeah. Uh, we have the Energy Lab stickers coming in this week. Yes. Um, yeah, hopefully it should be today, actually, according to the shipping uh, notice. Um, you should and, mail me a few. Yeah, I will mail you a few. Um, we'll try to... I'll try to get some of those out to some of the early contributors uh, as well. <laughs> and maybe, you know, some of the people who actually sit through this Twitch stream, uh, we'll get you guys some stickers <laughs> if you send us a message. Um, so we got those coming. And I think we're going to do, we got to catch up with some planning around doing a hackathon. Um, if, if, uh, you see this and you're something you'd be interested in is attending a hackathon in the, uh, you know, in the Bay area in California or, you know, someplace else, um, you know, give us, uh, you know, give, send us a message, let us know what, what your interest is. Okay. There you are. And, uh, we'll, we'll, we're, we're just starting to sort of plan and coordinate these now and settle on where we're going to do them. And how we're gonna get, you know, how we're how we're gonna market them and, and get people to, you know, uh, incent incentivize them to to participate. And uh, so keep an eye out for that. I think the hackathons are gonna be a lot of, a lot of fun. Uh, pizza, free beer, as in free beer, <laughs> and free <laughs> free pizza, as in free pizza. So. Uh, <laughs> I it's think. like it's it's better than saying like free beer is in puppy or free pizza is in puppy. Yeah, free pizza is in puppies. Because then people think we put puppy on our pizzas. Hmm. We don't. We don't do that. At least not yet. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, that's all I I sort of have from that uh, perspective. If uh, do, was there anything you'd like to cover? 
I don't think so. Like I said, uh, the, the, the existing project plan for the next release is a little bit of a mess. So the URL that you saw on the screen earlier is, is going to stay the same, but just expect that the, the different things around the plan will, will probably move um, because I've only had a chance to look at it and, you know, right now. So it, it'll, it'll probably move around, but we're hoping to do a new release probably at the end of the week, if not, if, or at the beginning of next week at the very latest. Okay. Yeah. We'll make sure that we, uh, you know, message out and retweet and all that stuff to make sure everyone yeah. is up to speed on that. Nice. Yeah. Well, it's been a good stream and a uh, good, good session here. Uh, assuming we don't have any questions uh, in chat. I'm going to, I'm going to assume. Yeah, it looks like we have a uh, three viewers just uh, making sure that they have no questions in the chat. Yeah. Nothing, nothing in the chat right now. Yeah. <laughs> what are you What are you looking at? Uh, I was just checking to make sure that the that the chat was still empty. Oh, all right. Okay. Well, if that's it, then uh, we'll be back 10 a.m. next week. Hopefully, with some logos on the screen and wearing uh, wearing an NRE TV logoed button shirt. We're gonna have some of those really sweet, like, like uh, animated, like. Instead of donations, whenever somebody contributes, oh my god, whenever somebody contributes a lesson, we should treat it like what normal Twitch streamers have, like when they have uh, donations, like balloons, like, like animated balloons come up the screen or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've seen that. Yeah, we should do something like that. And then people get their name in lights, but they they can't contribute money because that's easy. They got to contribute a lesson, and when that lesson contributes, we'll tie in GitHub. We'll say like, whenever a new PR is created, um, we'll we'll publish that to the stream. Good call. Boom. All right, dude. All right. <laughs> we'll have to come up with some animations then. Yes. All right, man. All right. Uh, with that, then uh, we're signing off, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>